Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome back to the BH Virtual Event Space. Very happy to welcome back to the BH Virtual Event Space, Brent De Silva. Brent, how are you today? Hey, Scott, I'm great. Excellent. We are great as well because if you have been living under a rock today and you missed our last event, it's National Pet Day. So get excited about that. Everybody loves some kind of creature. It doesn't have to be a furry one, but some kind of creature. Uh, whatever that might be, walking the uh, walking the planet, in, including us, we're humans, we're animals as well. So we, I think we count as well. So at least if you love yourself, that's that's all that matters. But uh, Brent is here today. He's going to be talking about unique pet photography in the studio. So we're super excited for that. Just as a reminder to everybody who is joining us here, if you're here on Zoom, you can use the Q and A feature to ask any questions you may have for Brent. Or if you're joining us on YouTube, Facebook, or Vimeo, any of our streaming services, you can go ahead and ask those questions in the comment section, and we'll make sure to get them addressed towards the end of this presentation. But Brent, I just want to say thanks again for being here. Looking forward to it. And uh, it's all yours. The show is, shows up to you now. All right. Thank you. I'm just going to share my screen here. Okay. All right, so welcome everybody. Happy National Pet Day. Uh, it seems like uh, a bit of a redundant day. Seems like we treat our pets uh, as if it's National Pet Day every day, but uh, nonetheless, I'm really excited to be here with you to share all about uh, my unique pet photography uh, in the studio. So my name is Brent De Silva, and I'm a pet photographer based in Brampton, Ontario, Canada. I specialize mostly in dogs, but uh, no pets are off limits and I'm really excited to, uh, to dive into some, some unique and exciting uh, uh, creatures that I've encountered uh, throughout my journey. So before I get started with my presentation today, uh, let me just quickly say thank you to BNH once again. Um, really, this is an honor to be here to share, to share my work. I, I've learned so much from BNH, from the great photographers that they've had uh, come on online to present. And so uh, to be here today to share, it's, uh, it's really a pleasure. So together today, uh, we're going to dive into the topic of pet photography in the studio. It's, of course, something I'm super passionate about. And uh, so I apologize in advance if, I speaking, if I'm speaking very quickly. Um, I really want to jam pack uh, this webinar today with a lot of value for you. So uh, just bear with me a little bit. So together, we're going to explore uh, things like lenses. We're going to talk about retouching. We're going to talk about lighting. We're going to talk about all the type of camera gear. We're going to talk about different backdrops, setups, and uh, Photoshop tips, and, and handling pets, and, and all that kind of fun stuff. We're going to get really, really go deep into it today. And of course, at the end of my presentation, I'll, I'll take some questions too. So let's get right into it. So uh, we're going to talk about pet photography in the studio today. But before that, I really want to emphasize here that studio photography doesn't need to be expensive or overwhelming. So you don't need a big budget to begin this journey or to even work as a professional and to make some money yourself. So you can make great art with the gear that you most likely already have. So sometimes when we think of studio photography, especially if we're used to shooting with natural light, uh, thinking about studio lighting and all this kind of stuff, it can be daunting. You know, we might think that we need to take out a lease for a big warehouse space and that we need to learn all these different ins and outs of the technicalities of different lighting and modifiers and strobes and, and speed lights and all this kind of stuff. But it really doesn't have to. Be. So I personally, I started my business with a very basic Canon Rebel T3 entry level camera. I had a 50 millimeter 1.8 lens. I had an 18 to 55 millimeter kit lens. I had a speed light and I had two continuous lighting soft boxes. And so my studio was any blank, flat finish vertical surface. So these right here, these are two of my uh, very first uh, subjects. Um, the owner sought me out after I had shared some photos of my own dog that I, that I just took for fun and I shared on Facebook. And these are friends of mine. They said, hey, can you photograph our dogs uh, in the same kind of style that you've been photographing your own dogs? And I said, mm, sure. And uh, so at the time, I, I, I'll be honest, I had little to no idea what I was doing, but I was having a lot of fun. I found uh, something that I was really passionate about, and so I just stuck with it. So on the left here, we have Nuts, and he's got a little mohawk, he's got a little t-shirt, and this photo was taken with my uh, old Canon Rebel T3, 50 millimeter 1.8 lens. I set up two continuous lighting softboxes on either side of him, 
and uh, the blank, uh, the, the backdrop was just a blank wall in, in my client's home. And today this photo is blown up and it, it's hanging on that same wall today. So on the right, we have Watson the Dalmatian. This was taken once again, Rebel T3, uh, simple 18 to 55 millimeter kit lens. I had a speed light that I mounted to my camera. I aimed it at the, the ceiling, the white ceiling in, in their living room. And uh, it, it uh, bounced light down really nicely onto uh, Watson here. And the black backdrop, it's just a, the back of a black sofa in their living room. So, so very simple. So I photographed uh, throughout my career over a thousand dogs. But these two photos here, they're uh, photos that uh, even though they're some of my first, I'm still very proud of them. So here's Nuts. Uh, it's a behind the scenes shot. We've got the two continuous lighting soft boxes. Uh, it's very simple, cheap, it's portable. And this was my first professional shoot. Of course, uh, today I've got a full blown studio uh, with more lights and gear than I really should have, like you know most photographers. But I just wanna show you that it doesn't need to be complicated or expensive. And uh, I really want to hammer this, this point home. So here's another example, okay? So I don't want the idea of a studio to overwhelm you. So this is Neo. It's a gorgeous black cat. So I arrived at, uh, at my client's home to photograph their tarantula. And, and I'll be sharing some of those photos later on. Now, before I arrived, they didn't tell me that they had Neo. They didn't tell me that they had a cat. So I, I, I arrived, I, I came with the right gear just to photograph a small tarantula. And, you know, I show up and there's Neo there. And, and of course, I, I can't just photograph one of their pets and leave. Uh, it feels like, you know, that would be some kind of like neglect or something. You know, we got to photograph all the pets in the household. So I wasn't prepared to shoot a cat, though. But I am always willing to figure out a way to make things work. And so I got creative and I improvised a state of the art uh, photography studio suitable for a cat on the spot. So here's my state of the art cat photography studio set up in my client's home. It's simply a gaming chair. And there's just this black cloth that uh, I, I just had in my car. I keep it in my car just to, you know, uh, wrap furniture up and stuff so that my car doesn't get scratched. But uh, it, I thought, you know what, let's try Let's see what we can do. Now, of course, cats, they don't sit on command like dogs. So we had to improvise uh, a bit of a comfortable situation for him. So uh, we put some catnip on the gaming chair here. He put the cloth down. And uh, we got him to settle in and to lounge. So my main light here, it's a 36 inch Octabox. It's positioned above him. And on camera right, we have a hair light or a rim light and the human light stand, which is actually Neo's human. So sometimes I get the owners to just assist and that's what he ended up doing. And uh, he did a great job. He aimed the light perfectly. It was, it was perfect. And he's just holding a, a small speed light. And if you notice here, it's just adding a little bit of pop just creating a bit of a uh, dimension, a bit of separation from Neo, from the black backdrop, of course, black cat, black backdrop. Uh, sometimes you can have your subject disappear. So this light is just adding a little bit of, uh, of that uh, uh, outline. And I'll be sharing more about lighting as we get into it. But uh, th that's all it really took for me to just throw together this studio on the fly. So here's another shot of Neo, same setup. I'm really proud of these images. And today I'm going to show you how you can create your own just like it. So now that I, I hope I've, uh, I've got you uh, bought into the idea of studio photography not being this really expensive, overwhelming endeavor, let's uh, go over quickly what we're going to talk about today. So we're going to talk about uh, camera gear. We're going to talk about camera settings. I'm going to share my one light setup. I'm going to talk about my two to three light setup that I have, uh, I've used with this dog over here. We're going to, we're going to talk about catch lights. I'm going to speak about backdrop materials. I'm going to talk about uh, focal length choice, uh, props and accessories. Uh, we're going to go into uh, uh, Photoshop and, and talk about retouching. Rather, I'm not going to go into Photoshop, but I'm going to show you some Photoshop uh, tricks that I use uh, uh, to, to bring my images to their final, uh, final stage. And finally, I'll give you some tips to get started as a pet photographer. So my camera gear. So before I get into sharing about my gear, I have to preface this quickly just by saying that I'm not a very technical photographer, nor am I a pixel peeper. I'm frugal. I like to pull myself up by my bootstraps as a business person. And so, like I mentioned, I started out with a Canon Rebel T3 and a kit lens. I've since upgraded my gear, but it hasn't been a huge upgrade. So I don't use top of the line gear and I really don't think it's necessary for the work that I do. Of course, I understand I might get some flack for this. Um, most of the time I use a Canon SL2, uh, camera body. It has a 24 megapixel crop sensor 
And uh, my go-to lens is a Canon 18 to 200 millimeter telephoto lens. I also love the Canon uh, 10 to 18 millimeter wide angle lens. And occasionally I'll also use a Canon uh, 100 millimeter uh, 2.8 macro lens for uh, smaller pets to get in really close to capture some nice detail. So keep in mind that these are on a crop sensor. So for the zoom lenses, the full frame equivalents, uh, they'd be uh, a 28 to 320 millimeter and a 16 to 28 millimeter. Of course, I don't think those lenses exist for full frame. And so the closest available uh, would be uh, 24 to 105 and a 17 to 40 millimeter. So I'll be honest, I'm a little defensive and insecure about this. I'm here, I'm presenting on B&H and uh, you know, gear is such a hot topic, but please hear me out. Because pets rarely sit still, they're spontaneous, they're impulsive, they're sometimes they're stubborn. I found that the extreme versatility of the 18 to 200 millimeter to be perfect for my job. So no matter how or where an animal decides to pose on the backdrop, I'm almost always ready to zoom in or out to capture them. So with the prime lens, I'd feel paralyzed. Uh, so I'm willing to sacrifice some sharpness for the incredible versatility that these lenses offer me. And like I said, I'm not a pixel peeper and I really don't feel that my clients are either. Uh, the Canon 18 to 200 millimeter, it only fits on crop sensor cameras like the SL2. I like full frame cameras, but in my studio setting, I find the SL2, it serves me well. So I don't need low, low light capability because I shoot with bright strobes. I also don't consider depth of field very much uh, in terms of the camera sensors or the lenses that I use because I, I like to shoot at F8 or higher to really get a sharp image. I love bokeh, you know, as much as the next person, but as I've developed, I found that it's not my style when working with pets. And I'll explain more about that in a minute uh, when I speak about my settings. Of course, uh, I, I do have my eye on the Canon R5, especially with the animal eye autofocus and uh, I'm, I'm saving up. I think that'll be my next big purchase. So let's talk about my camera settings quickly. So I always shoot with strobes. So my shutter speed is, is set to one 200th of a second to sync with my lights. And my ISO is at its lowest setting on my camera, which is 100. So I never really change those settings. The only setting that I do change is my f-stop. So that's my aperture. And it varies based on a few factors. And those factors are, firstly, it's my, the pet's uh, proximity to my light source. So I never shoot with a light meter. I find it completely useless when working with pets. You know, they constantly move. And, and by the time you try to accurately meter anything, uh, the, the moment will just be lost. So what I do is I simply adjust my aperture according to how near or far uh, my subject is to my lights at any given moment. So if they decide to sit close to light, I'll stop down a bit just to allow a little less light into the lens and uh, just to avoid blowing out any of the highlights. And if they decide to move further away, I'll open my aperture up and I'll let, let more light in and avoid underexposing them. So this little guy here, he's a San Francisco garter snake. And uh, he was really fast and he was constantly moving around, but I managed to capture this, this cute shot here. So like I said, I'm not a technical photographer. I consider myself to be an intuitive photographer. So I'm more than happy to capture a great shot that's not perfectly exposed. I can usually correct all of this uh, by post-processing the raw files. And so like I said, you'll notice that I, I typically shoot at F8 or higher. So the reason for this is that I prefer to have everything generally quite sharp in my images. As well, pets, they don't sit still. And so if I shoot wide open with a very shallow depth of field, I fear that many, uh, many great shots would be useless because I may not have tack sharp focus in the eyes as the animals move around. So with the higher f-stop, I can afford to miss focus a little bit and still have usable images. As well, detail is part of my style. I like to see the different textures of the animals in my photos as opposed to creamy out of focus uh, bokeh. So the other reason I adjust my f-stop is when working with multiple pets. So I want to ensure that they're all sharp. Uh, so I might turn my lights up really bright and stop my lens down to f16 or f20. I don't want to have uh, just one, one pet sharp with, with their eye sharp and the others are kind of blurring out out of, out of focus. I want them all to be sharp. And so that's, that's why I really uh, uh, um, uh, bring my f-stop up to about you know, f16, f20. So you'll notice here, these cats here, uh, a lot of nice, nice detail in the, uh, the finer hairs and, and whatnot. I really love this image. So now let's talk about lighting. So I generally have uh, two lighting setups that I use when photographing pets. 
So the first is just a very simple one light setup with a strobe and a 36 inch Octabox used to modify it. So, I, so you could get away with any medium to large modifier and a simple speed light if you wanted. So I typically like to place the light at about a 45 degree angle directly in front of the subject, like in the diagram here. So a regular light stand will work, but the best thing is to have a boom arm or a C stand so that you don't have anything between yourself and the pet. So this is my go-to setup on any backdrop color, except for dark ones like black. So I'll go, uh, I'll go more into detail about backdrops in a few minutes. So here are some examples of photos that I've taken with this simple one light setup. So here's a shot, uh, three, three dogs. Lighting groups of people, it can be really difficult at times, especially if you're trying to expose them all nice and evenly. It can sometimes require massive modifiers uh, and they can take up a lot of space and they can, of course, be really expensive. But with dogs, they're super small. And so you can get away with, with just one light and light, light them all very nice and evenly here. So this is lit uh, with a 36 inch Octabox uh, with my strobe in there. So let's talk quickly about catch lights and how to read them. So if you haven't learned this already, I think it's really cool and it's incredibly useful for deciphering uh, different lighting setups that you may come across uh, of people or, or animals. So each of these dogs' eyes, you'll notice a little white dot. So that's a catch light. And it's the highlight caused by my Octabox flashing during the photo. So you'll notice the catch light in each of this puppy's eyes at the top edge as well. There's a, it's a, there's a single white shape and it's about half a circle cut off by the edge of the ice. So uh, this tells us that the light, the light modifier that was used was uh, circular. So perhaps it was an octobox or an umbrella. Catch lights are very, very important in portraiture, whether it's of pets or people. They add light and life to the eyes. So if there's no catch light due to the dog looking too far downward or the light not being placed correctly, I don't think that the image would be powerful enough to be selected in most cases. So the eyes will uh, likely uh, be in shadows and they won't look as lively. So now take a look here at the less intense, but still prominent highlight at the bottom of his eyes. So this is also a catch light, which is caused by the reflection of the white backdrop just below the puppy's face. So when we're photographing people, we sometimes include a reflector below their face to bounce light up and to fill in any shadows caused by lighting from above. But this isn't necessary when we're shooting a dog on a white background or any uh, small pet um, because of their size. So because they're so close to the floor, any of the shadows are automatically filled in by the reflection of the white background below. So this creates a very nice, open and pleasant feeling to the image. So here's another uh, photo uh, of a puppy. He's looking downward. He's, you'll notice there's no bright catch light at the top of his eyes. We do have the catch light at the bottom of his eye, but uh, which is from the backdrop, but that alone isn't enough to bring that vibrant, lively feeling to his face. So we need, to, we need the light hitting his face properly to really show how cute he is. And of course, you can tell I haven't even bothered to retouch this image. Uh, it's a reject and the white balance is all off, we got crumbs and stuff. Here he is again, his name is Atreus, and this time he's looking upward. Uh, we've got the nice bright catch light in his eyes and he's got a very well lit face. And once again, you can read the catch lights and you can see that I've used a simple one light setup. Of course, uh, you can see the reflection of the white backdrop from below. It's filling any shadows underneath his, uh, his chin here as well. So sometimes people will Photoshop catch lights into an image. It can work, but keep in mind, it's not just about the catch lights in the eyes. It's also about the light hitting the overall face properly. And a catch light is an indication of that, as well as something that really adds a lot of uh, uh, vibrancy and life to an image. So maybe you notice something seems off about Ezio the cat here. So I just went in and I quickly Photoshopped the catch lights out. I just wanted to emphasize how significant they are. So sometimes when I see on, on Facebook groups and, and whatnot, when people are asking for um, um, constructive criticism, often it's the catch lights that, uh, that, that uh, they're, they're missing out on. And it's, it's a very subtle thing. It's easy to overlook. It's just two, two very small uh, you know, white dots uh, in, in an animal's eyes. But uh, it, it really, really makes a big difference. And, and I'll just go back here just to show you how significant it is. You, you see here, he looks like a zombie or, or lifeless or something like that. 
And then we just add that and it just takes it to another level. So here we have uh, two gorgeous German shepherds, their brother and sister, and they're lit with one uh, 36 inch octobox from above. We've got a nice budgie, uh, same thing, same light, 36 inch octobox from above. You'll notice the catch light here as well. And here we've got a smiley dog. Uh, he's on the sort of a mocha colored paper backdrop. We've got uh, one octobox lighting him from above. Same thing. And here's a close up headshot of a collared lizard. The same one light setup. He's looking like, uh, like you can tell he's, he's very much like a dinosaur. This is shot with a uh, 100 millimeter macro. So let's talk about my other lighting setup, which I typically use on dark backdrops mostly black. So it's a two to three lighting setup, but please don't be alarmed if you're not familiar with studio lighting. It's not as scary as it sounds. We just have to build up one light at a time. So we'll begin with the same one light setup as earlier, but we're gonna introduce some rim lights to highlight the edges of our subject to separate them from the backdrop and make them pop. Like how I mentioned earlier with Neo the black cat on the black backdrop. So you don't necessarily need these rim lights, but it's definitely recommended, especially when photographing dark colored dogs or dark colored cats or any dark colored animal or subject in general on dark backgrounds. So you don't want the subject to blend in with the background. You want them to stand out. So you could get away with, with just one, uh, you, you, making it just a two light setup, or, or if, if, you, if you can throw in another one there, make it a, th a three light setup and, and just add a little bit more interest to your images. I prefer to use one on either side. I have the lights and so I have the space and, and so I, I take advantage of that. So uh, in my diagram here, I've shown the rim lights as just two speed lights on stands. They're angled at about 45 degrees uh, without any modifier. So you don't even need a modifier, uh, but you should be mindful of how that will impact your photos. And if, you, if you're wondering what I mean by modifier, I mean, you don't need to put an umbrella on this. You don't need to put a, uh, a strip box or anything. You can just put the Put the, uh, the speed light on, on, a, on a stand, on a tripod, and just fire away. I just want to be mindful of the impact that that will have on your photos, and I'll show you in a little bit. You'll have a very hard highlight, and the light will be going everywhere, including on the backdrop. Um, if you're shooting at a wide angle, you may also get some light from these rim lights uh, directly going into your lens, causing some flaring. And uh, it could be a cool effect, but it's something to be mindful of, and it's something to do and, and use uh, consciously. Of course, um, you could also modify these with strip boxes to get a little bit more control. Uh, that's typically what I use now, but uh, sometimes I do like to just, uh, just use a bare head, no modifier at all. Uh, when it comes to the power settings of these lights, it really depends on the distance, uh, the color of the dog or the, the, the pets, and uh, the overall effect that you're going for. I'm an intuitive photographer. My, my, my method is just to, to fire away and I just adjust the lights as I go. So here's a really nice black dog uh, shot with a three light setup. Uh, clients sometimes tell me it, it's really hard to photograph their black dog. And sometimes when I tell them I want to use a black background, uh, they think I'm crazy. But uh, I just say, hold on, let, let's, let's see what we can do here. And, and we create images like this. So with this simple technique, we can make any, any black cat, any black dog pop off a black background. So we have our main light which uh, we can see based on the catch lights in the eyes. It's a nice octobox. It's really taking up a lot of, uh, a lot of real estate in the eyes there. So uh, we can tell that it's either really close to the dog or it's very large. Next, we'll look at the highlights on the edge of the dog on, on either side. We have a nice uh, light uh, creating dimension and shaping her body. We can see uh, the swirls of fur. We've got some nice definition in her, uh, her, in her cheekbones. She's not disappearing into the background. We have some nice contrast here. She looks really regal. She's looking off in the distance. If you're working with pets, uh, don't get frustrated if they're not looking into your lens at all times. Uh, sometimes they're shy. Sometimes they're, they're distracted. It's all good. You can get some really, uh, really great stuff nonetheless. So here's a shot of Doodle the bunny. So with the same three light setup, except the one on camera left has been gelled with a nice blue. So I love to use gels. It's part of my signature style. If you're new to lighting and you really want to see the impact of uh, your different lighting setups, experiment with gels. It really makes it easy to see what's happening. So sometimes when we don't have gels and we have multiple lighting setups, it's, it's, and especially when we're new, it's difficult to see which light is doing what to our image. But if we add a gel, we can really see, okay, that light is 
is creating this effect and, and we can, we can uh, hone our eye a little bit, develop our eye to the more subtle subtleties of light. So in Doodle's eyes here, you're going to notice two catch lights. So one is the main octobox overhead, same 36 inch octobox. And uh, one here is the, it's the rear uh, uh, rim light uh, that's on uh, camera right, uh, right about here. So Doodle's eyes, they're, they're really big and they're really round. And so they were able to pick up on that uh, catch light, uh, even though it's, you know, almost uh, behind her head. And of course, you'll notice the, the, the highlights here, which that rim light is, is adding a little bit on the ear as well. Just adding some subtle dimension and depth, depth to the image. So here's another image. And this one, uh, you've got the blue gel on the right. So this is only a two light setup. Uh, just one rim light, one rim light instead of two. Uh, the dog, he, he wasn't dark colored, so naturally he didn't blend into the background. So a rim light uh, to add separation wasn't necessary. I just wanted to add a subtle hint of blue uh, to complement the orange, um, and just to add a little bit more extra impact to this image. I mean, as if uh, you know him tilting his head ninety degrees here wasn't enough of an impact already. Uh, if you're wondering how I got him to do this, I was just making weird noises. And weird noises go a long way with some dogs. And uh, this is uh, another all-time favorite image of mine. This is Chief. So here's probably my favorite image that I've taken this year so far. This is Nina Simone. She's an American bully. And once again, you'll notice the catch light uh, in her eye. That's my 36-inch octobox position just overhead. As well, you'll see camera right. We have a nice bright white highlight outlining her body, adding dimension. And of course, separating her from the background as well. And then on camera left, we have a similar effect going on, except this light's been gelled with a red gel. Shows her musculature, complements her eye a little bit. It spills onto the background as well, just creating a little bit more interest to the image. And of course, you can get creative. You can, you can definitely add multiple gels to uh, those rim lights. And... Um, and, and so even though this is, this is a, a white Maltese here, we don't need a rim light because she's not gonna disappear into the background, but we can still add those rim lights in to add color add, and add some interest. And of course, once you uh, gel both those rim lights with two different colors, then you can bring it into Photoshop and you can tweak those colors even further. So you have a lot uh, of, of room to get creative with color. So here's a couple of photos shot with almost the same lighting setup as the previous photos. So we have this gorgeous Husky here. He had a, he had a uh, blue eye. He was very winter-esque look. And so I had to throw in a, a blue gel. Again, this is a two light setup. Uh, we've got one Octobox lighting from the front and a bareheaded speed light um, with the blue gel lighting from the rear right side here. Uh, so I shot this wide with no modifier on the flash head. So the light was just spilling everywhere. Some of it actually got into the lens itself. It created uh, this kind of hazy effect. There was also some, uh, some flaring with some, some, some shapes and things were forming as a result of the light going directly into my lens, which I retouched out, but we can keep those in depending on the style you're going for. The same thing over here with this dog. I use an orange gel on a, on a bare speed light. Once again, uh, I wanted to match uh, his eyes, uh, his fur a little bit with the orange. And some of that light spilled over onto the black background on the floor too creating a very nice, warm, fiery feel to the image. So you can see here the shadows, they're very hard. So what that means is that our light source was a small light source, uh, which of course it is, it's a bareheaded speed light. So when you learn lighting, you can look at a photo that you like and you can, re, uh, you can reverse engineer how it's been lit and, and create those effects yourself. So you don't always need to you know, be able to contact the photographer and ask them what lighting setup they used. You can experiment just by understanding how to read shadows, how to read soft light, hard light, how to read the catch lights, how to read um, how the light is falling on the subject as well. So to wrap up my section on lighting, here's a very interesting image, I think. So initially, you'll see that there's no main catch light in her eyes. All we have is the reflection of the white floor just in front of her. So I said earlier that nice, clear catch lights, they are important. And, and they really are, but this image breaks that rule a little bit and that's why I've included it here. So in reality, this is a really sweet, gentle, friendly dog, but she has a very tough look and I wanted to capture that. 
So the lack of a main catch light, though 100% not intentional on my part, admittedly, it worked really well. It made her look like she's ready to pounce out of the darkness like a panther. So in this case, the reflection from, from below serves as enough of a catch light to give her some life to make this image work. I feel like if we had nice big catch lights in the top of her eyes, kind of like the, the puppies we were looking at earlier, it just would make her look a little too cute and it would take away from this, this really, uh, uh, really ominous vibe we got going on here. So you'll see on the right of the image, there's a beam of light and um, that's, that, that's lit with a, a bareheaded speed light. So I just had uh, my assistant just hold the speed light a handheld like we had uh, with Neo earlier. And uh, they just aimed right at um, her face here and it, it, it was perfect. The light, the, the, the light just hit really well, it was set perfectly. And we got this great image. Like I've been saying, I'm not a technical photographer. And so there's no time to be overly technical and to take you know, multiple leisurely test shots in a situation like this. And the reason that is, is because I didn't pose the dog this way. She just decided to lay down and give me this look. Um, and, and so that's why immediately I just asked my assistant, go ahead, just, just aim the light and we're just going to shoot and just hope that everything is set. And, and it worked out really well. So I'm, I, I, I just, I rely on my previous knowledge in moments like this. I rely on my practice and I just act intuitively and I just hope for the best. So in this moment, I know that this dog is about to stand up. She's about to lay down. She's about to yawn. She's about to scratch herself. She's going to do something other than pose, just like really beautifully how she is here. And so there's no time for, for uh, making sure our lightings, uh, our, our light settings are all, all powered up correctly. And there's no time for, for adjusting uh, this and that. We just have to go with the moment and really capture it. So of course I got lucky and, and everything worked out in this image. You can note the, uh, the deep shadows here. I learned this kind of lighting from, from Peter Hurley's headshot work. So he brings out men's jawlines with a similar kind of kicker lights on, on their cheekbones and um, makes them look very masculine. And uh, that's the kind of look that I was going for here. Uh, we, we have some deep shadows here, but we still maintain some detail in the highlights as well. You know, big shout out to Peter Hurley. Uh, he's a photographer that, that taught me how to see light before I was blind to all this kind of stuff. But after uh, exploring his portraiture work, I, I learned how to see light. My eyes opened up a little bit more. And I hope that they continue to. I'm sure there's things that I'm overlooking still, but I hope to, to keep learning how to see more and more uh, deeply. So now let's use this image to talk about uh, backdrops. So... I use a giant black cloth as a backdrop and uh, you can see it here in this image, of course. I sometimes I just bunch it up and I let the dogs lounge in it. Sometimes I'll pull it tight and flat. It's very versatile. And I, I especially like it because it can be washed. So dogs, um, um, you know, they'll, they'll shed, they'll, they'll get treats on it, they'll get drool. Sometimes we'll get peanut butter, it'll get a mess and I can just throw it in the washing uh, machine and it comes out clean as opposed to working with paper, which, you know, sometimes has to be uh, uh, thrown out because it just gets really, really messy. So in this image in particular, the dog, she's got one paw on white seamless paper, which I have just below the black cloth. So uh, this wasn't my intention, but uh, it really added beautiful contrast here. It gives it almost like a bit of a 3D effect as if she's about to jump out of the frame completely. So what I do in my studio is I have the white seamless paper uh, set up, and then I just hang the cloth, the black cloth right on top of it when I'm ready to, to switch to the black. So my other go-to uh, backdrop is, of course, the white seamless. And in post-processing, I'll, I'll clean it up. And uh, sometimes I'll even make it perfectly white, like we see here. So I'll just use the levels adjustments, and I'll, I'll just push, uh, push all those highlights uh, uh, as far as I can go until they're perfectly white, while still maintaining, you know, like a drop shadow and, uh, and, and not having it look like the dog was, you know, uh, just cut out and, and put onto a, a white backdrop. Sometimes I'll let that white uh, seamless paper fall into a light gray as well, especially when working with lighter colored dogs uh, like this one here. So here's a nice cat named Jughead uh, on a turquoise seamless paper backdrop. And here we have Rico and Nova. So uh, these two gorgeous dogs are really special. Their owner's a professional dog trainer 
and uh, Sarah can position Rico in almost any pose and he'll just freeze. So uh, she put him in this pose upside down and we had some fun here. And this is definitely an all-time favorite image of mine. I love to work with this mocha colored uh, seamless paper backdrop as well. Uh, the main challenge with colored backdrops is dealing with the retouching process. So drool and, 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 and things like that can really stand out and it can make it uh, challenging to clone it out at times, especially in the shadowy areas here as well. But overall, paper backdrops, they're great, but they can get costly when working with pets, especially, you know, uh, dogs, um, because they like to drool, they like to scratch on them, they like to, uh, you know, spill treats and crumbs, and sometimes if they're puppies or they're nervous or scared, they'll, you know, they'll have an accident on the paper. And so this is something to keep in mind when considering your costs, especially, uh, you know, if you're used to photographing people who can, for the most part, keep, keep the papers nice and clean. And, and you can, you know, maybe last your whole career with, with a sheet if you really wanted to. But with, uh, with dogs, uh, the paper, you can run through it pretty quickly. Uh, cloth is nice too, but I found that if you have a really big sheet, you're likely to get a lot of bunching up, uh, which might not help if you're going for a really clean look. And I typically only use a black cloth. Uh, for any other color, I prefer paper. And uh, like I showed in the beginning, any plain vertical surface with a flat finish can work well, at least for headshots of dogs. So it should be flat to avoid any glare from your lights. So here's a Chinese water dragon. He shot on white, but not seamless paper. This was actually taken with a tabletop uh, product photography light box. Super cheap, super, very portable, very easy to use. So here's a behind the scenes shot. So we have the light box on an elevated surface. And in the rear, you can see the reflection of my Octabox on the glass of, uh, of his enclosure. So for small pets, this is literally all you need. In fact, you don't even have to spend money on a light box like this. Uh, even though they are very affordable, you could easily build something very similar with just white foam board. And uh, it doesn't have to have that, that uh, sort of um, cove, that curve. Um, in, in post, you can go in and just, just push the highlights and you get rid of any, any hard lines that come as a result of, of two uh, surfaces meeting your, your horizontal plane and your vertical plane. So if you just get two pieces of foam board, you can just uh, you know, make a little bit of a, a platform and, and you'll be good to go. Uh, let's talk about focal length here. So focal length is the angle of view of a lens. So typically we understand that the wider a focal length, the more distorted the perspective will be. So this image is shot at 28 millimeters or 18 millimeters on a crop sensor. So that's pretty wide. And as a result, we see some obvious distortion. So the dog's head, it looks massive with an enormous nose. And in simple terms, we have some serious fisheye effect going on over here. So personally, I love it. It's a unique perspective. It's almost like a caricature of a dog. As an artist, I like to experiment and find unique perspectives and using wide angles is a great way for me to do that. Here's the same dog, similar pose. This time it's shot at 56 millimeters or 35 millimeters on a crop sensor. So we can see that everything looks more realistic and reasonable. His nose is a normal size when compared to the rest of his body. So there's, this is, th that's one great benefit of using a lens with a very wide focal range, like my 18 to 200 millimeter lens. So you can create these very diverse shots one after another within seconds, just by adjusting your focal length and recomposing your shots, all while the dog stays put in one position. So once again, we'll show just really quickly, super wide and then more reasonable, all shot within the same, same few seconds. Here's Atreus, uh, the puppy again, and this time he's shot at a, at a wide angle. So the distortion really works well on puppies. Uh, it makes them look super cute with their big noses. So here's another puppy here. We have Cora, the black German Shepherd. Uh, once again, shot with a wide angle lens. Uh, we've got 18 millimeters on a full frame, uh, 10 millimeters on a crop sensor. And here's Finley. So you can look at the size of his tongue. The distortion really exaggerates how long it is. This is funny, it's cute, it's creative. Now keep in mind, I'm not shooting for a veterinary anatomy textbook. I'm shooting for his owners. And so the proportions don't need to be accurate. And a dog isn't gonna complain about, you know, having a big nose in the way that, that a person might. I wanna show my clients their dog in a way that they've never seen them before, whether it's from a unique framing angle or a unique focal length. Of course, I don't shoot exclusively with wide angles. I like to take a variety of different images throughout a session. 
So here he is again. In all of these images where I've used the wide angle, I'm required to get really close to the dog in order to film the frame with their body. So this means that I have to have a good rapport with the dog so that they trust me to get close and to essentially corner them on the backdrop. It also means that they have to have no fear of the camera because sometimes it could be literally inches away from their face. So the benefit of shooting with a wide angle like this is that I can maintain a really good connection with the dog. I can give them a treat without moving. I can pet them. I can talk to them. And I can also easily just stop them from running away because I'm so close to begin with. But of course, for the most part, I wouldn't begin a session with this type of focal length. I would build up to it after building the dog's trust, getting to learn the dog's mannerisms, how they pose, and that sort of thing. So here's a Chinese water dragon again, this time shot at 10 millimeters on a crop sensor, which would be 18 millimeters on a full frame. I believe 16 millimeters on a full frame, I think. Um, anyway, my math might be way off. Uh, I'm composed, so I composed this shot uh, with a tail right up into the foreground and I focused on his eye in the background. I really wanted to create a very like in your face feeling with this image, with the tail. And I was inspired by, uh, by Platon's work and the way that he photographs people with, with really wide angles. He's, he, he photographs their, their hands, you know, right in, right in the frame and whatnot. I really love that. And so I was inspired uh, to experiment like that with the, uh, the Chinese water dragon here. So now let's talk about macro lenses. So this is the poison dart frog. And uh, they're about the size of a quarter in reality. So uh, their owner told me that in, in the wild, uh, they're poisonous because of something that they eat. And so uh, in, in captivity, they didn't have access to the, that particular food. And so they're, they're not poisonous. Um, if I remember correctly, just uh, keep that in mind before you go touching poisonous star frogs. But anyway, uh, so this was shot uh, with my 100 millimeter macro lens. And I was able to, uh, to use that lens to really capture them up super close like this. Like I said, they're about the size of a quarter. Um, and so very, very tiny. So I'm really, really in their face with the macro lens here. And this was once again, uh, just like the, uh, the, the lizard, uh, this was taken uh, on the uh, tabletop uh, light box. You'll notice a very shallow depth of field with their eye in focus, but uh, their right foot, which is you know, not even a few centimeters away, it's already blurry. Um, at 100 millimeters, I'm up so close that we have uh, this very narrow depth of field. So nailing focus can be a bit tricky. So it's very important that if you're doing work like this, you take a lot of photos just because, you know, when you go and look at them on your computer, you may notice that they're not perfectly tack sharp. So you want to make sure that you just keep snapping away because um, any little swaying, any little movement is going gonna, is gonna to throw the focus off a little bit. So um, this, this was lit as well with my uh, simple one light setup, 36 inch Octabox. And you can see that based on the catch light here. You'll also notice though, some bright highlights on the side here, almost as if uh, there was a rim light to the rear, but that's actually not a rim light. It's actually the reflection of the side walls of the light box bouncing light back at the frog here. So because they're so shiny to begin with, we also, it also contributes to getting these really bright highlights at the side here. I like the effect, but if I were to photograph them again, I would put some black paper or something on the sides just to stop that light from bouncing, just to see what kind of effect we would get. So here's a nice shot I took with the macro lens, 100 millimeter macro on my crop sensor camera, bringing it to about 160 millimeters. And... Uh, this is a, uh, a collared lizard, beautiful colors, beautiful textures. Once again, we've got a, a pretty narrow uh, depth of field area over here is in focus. Everything else is getting kind of blurry. Uh, with this type of macro work, I was just experimenting. You know, I don't really know where to focus. Typically, we focus on the eyes, but I really wanted to capture some texture. So it's a bit of a more of an abstract feel. So here's Tina the tarantula that I, I mentioned earlier. So she's 20 years old. I, I, I couldn't believe it. I didn't know the tarantulas could, uh, could live so long, but she's, uh, she's 20 years old and uh, really beautiful, really, really docile, gentile. I didn't, feel any, I didn't feel like I was in any danger. She would pose beautifully, posed uh, really, really uh, exciting for me to photograph her. And this was shot with 100 millimeter macro lens on uh, my crop sensor camera. 
So here's a super close up shot of the very uh, fine little hairs that she's got on her legs. So I wanted to capture some, uh, some, some macro shots like this. Um, there, there wasn't too much that I could do with her uh, uh, in terms of poses. Um, I, I photographed her from, from different angles and whatnot, but uh, because her, her eyes are very, very small, they didn't really uh, get a lot of, uh, they didn't get really any catch lights in them. So it was hard to photograph her, her from, from a sort of a perspective of getting her face. It was more about her body in, 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 in the session, but uh, I got some fun stuff like this. And I, I really like the abstract feel that uh, I came up with. So here's one of the most interesting subjects that I've met, and uh, it's, of course, a scorpion. So this is shot with my 100 millimeter macro lens, once again, on the tabletop, uh, uh, in the tabletop light box. Really uh, cool and, and exciting to see. Um, uh, I didn't want to get too close. They, they seemed a little on edge, but uh, they posed for me quite well. Here's a bit of a, an abstract close-up uh, shot of their... Uh, their tail. I, I wanted to capture some of the detail, the finer details of these, these little uh, fine hairs and whatnot. And uh, I had some fun photographing the scorpion. So here's Cinnamon, the crested gecko. So she shot with 100 millimeter uh, in the light box as well. I got really lucky with this shot uh, with her tongue out. I, I really love it. Here she is again, nice headshots. I just, I just love this smile, super cute. And uh, here she's literally walking on the wall of the light box on the, on the back wall. She's walking up it uh, vertically. And um, I, I, I love it. Uh, she was actually able to, uh, she's got like claws that were able to be a little sticky. And so uh, when she crawled up there, I saw this is a perfect moment to capture the beautiful uh, textures on her back. So I'm going to jump in some tips and tricks, uh, focusing exclusively on cats and dogs in a second. But before that, let me just share some of my work with snakes. So this is Jake the snake. He is massive. And so to capture this image, I had my strobe bouncing off the white ceiling in the room. So uh, I, I really wanted to, to get nice, even lighting all across the entire body. And because he was so big, I used the, the ceiling in, in, the, in the home as a giant softbox. And what I did was I, I just pointed my strobe at the ceiling and it uh, bounced light down nice and evenly just enough to cover his body like this so uh, for the backdrop I placed a, I placed a black cloth on the floor the cloth was a little slippery so he didn't have a lot of traction and so he was able to just stay in one spot kind of like he was on a treadmill and I uh, posed really beautifully for me uh, like this I, I really love this image one of my all-time favorites now here's something a little different uh, I photographed this snake, same idea uh, from above. I was staying on a chair, uh, same with, with Jake as well, staying on a chair with a wide angle lens and uh, on the black cloth. And in Photoshop, I just uh, created a mirror image of, of the snake just for fun. I, I, I like the symmetry. I liked uh, the way it kind of felt kind of uh, like a calligraphy or something like that. Just having some fun with, with, with art. So here's some quick tips and tricks for shooting cats and dogs in the studio. So for the most part, as a professional or as a hobbyist, cats and dogs will most likely make up the vast majority of your subjects. So from here on out, I'll be sharing exclusively about them. So when we're working with cats, it's important to understand that for the most part, they do whatever they want and you can't control them. You have to just be patient and be ready for whenever they decide to cooperate with you. Uh, with that said, though, catnip does go a long way. So keep some on hand. Uh, you can get them high and uh, it can inspire them to pose in some really cute and interesting ways for you. Their eyes get nice and big. Uh, it's a lot of fun uh, once they're a little doped up. As well, uh, laser pointers can be variable, very powerful tools to control their attention, to direct their attention as well. Uh, use some props. So I like to use this old, old wine barrel here for smaller dogs. It looks cute and it works well for pets that uh, don't like to stay in one spot. I also like to use this red foot stool sometimes on a red backdrop. Uh, so whenever you're working with smaller dogs, it's a great idea to raise them up on some sort of elevated surface like this. It can be a stool, it can be a bench, it can be a table. So uh, these puppies here, they're all sitting on a bench that just barely fits them. And so the reasons for using an elevated surface are firstly, the dogs are less likely to run away because it involves a jump. As a photographer, you can be in a more comfortable position uh, when photographing them as well. So sometimes small dogs, they're only a few inches tall and to get great shots, you need to be shooting at their level. Uh, you may notice that sometimes uh, the average uh, pet owner will take 
photos of, of their pets from, from uh, just standing up, photographing them, uh, 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 the, the, the dog on the floor, for example. Um, and so when you take a photo of their dog from their dog's level, it's like a perspective that they haven't seen before in, in photos. And, and that alone will, will really uh, uh, step up your, your photography from the average person. And so it's very important to consider your level when photographing uh, your subjects here. Uh, as well with a whole litter of puppies like this, it's almost impossible to keep them all nice and snug next to each other on a nine foot wide backdrop. Uh, they'll just keep wandering around. So an elevated surface works uh, really well for these, these litters. As well, use some accessories like uh, bow ties, bandanas, and other little things like that. So I have a collection of all sorts of things, and it's always fun to dress, uh, dress the dogs up and stuff. Um, in this case, uh, this oversized bow tie creates a sense of scale for the puppy, Willie. So he can come back for another photo sh shoot when he's older and bigger. He can wear the same bow tie and we'll, we'll be able to see how much he's grown. Uh, because I'm photographing on a, on a plain backdrop, there's nothing really in there to show the size of the dog. And so we don't have a sense of scale. And so sometimes these accessories can help with that. Here's Marshall. He's got a full outfit. Some dogs that don't mind dressing up. Some really don't like it. Uh, sometimes clients, you know, they don't like to see their dog dressed up. They think it's kind of weird, but some love it. I think it's hilarious. And uh, I mean, it looks pretty cool. All, all swagged out with his blue here. So here's another example of scale as well. Uh, so the owner was petting this little puppy and I just, I snapped the shot. Just the hand just shows how tiny he is. And on the other hand, Here's Floki, the Irish wolfhound. So she's absolutely massive. So I got her to sit on this chair, which is fit for an adult human. And, and just to show how big she is, on a plain backdrop, we wouldn't really get to, get to see and appreciate her size. But with that chair in there, we can see, oh my gosh, like this is a huge, huge animal. So here's another tip, which is, uh, it's pretty straightforward. Use treats, toys, and noise. So some cats and dogs, they're food motivated and some are toy driven. So I always have a few different toys and treats on hand, and I encourage my clients to bring their own as well. So some are picky, some go crazy for new treats, some have allergies and dietary restrictions. So keep all of this in mind as well. Toys are super important. Uh, I keep a handful of different toys, different textures, sizes, squeakers. Um, I use all of these things to get uh, the pets motivated and incentivized to pose. I, 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 it, it's much easier with dogs and, you know, you try with cats. Uh, it doesn't always work, but eventually something clicks and, and, and it just comes together. And finally, making weird noises, whether they're from my mouth or it's from a whistle or banging things or a noisemaker, I'm scratching or tapping it, all these different noises, they help a lot. Dogs perk up when they hear a new and unique sound, but you have to be ready to capture them once, once they, they perk up because after a little while, they'll get desensitized to those noises and uh, they're not going to care for it. So when working with dogs as well, you know, don't be afraid to be direct, loud, stern, and bossy at times. So dogs are not like humans. Uh, they need someone to be the boss. And sometimes you need to be that person during the session. So sometimes their owners, they may be very loving and kind and gentle, and that might work for them at home. But when you have a mission, you have a, you're, you have a goal, which is to get great images. You sometimes have to take the reins and, and be a little firm and, uh, and, and, and don't feel bad about that, okay? In addition to being firm, you do have to be patient. Uh, you have to also find the balance with patience. So remember, you're working with animals. They have no idea what a camera or a photograph even is. Uh, you got to give them time to warm up, settle down, and to learn how to cooperate with what you want them to do. So sometimes clients can feel anxious as well. They think, oh, you know, my dog or my cat, they're not cooperating. This is it's not working out. Uh, I never, never give in to that type of anxiety. We just always just, just roll with it. Something always clicks and it always works out. You just have to have that confidence and, and uh, the pets will pick up on that and they'll, they'll start, to, uh, start to work with you. So let's talk quickly about retouching. I know that we're, we're, uh, we're wrapping up our time here together. So I'm going to fly through this. But uh, retouching is a very important part of my process. I spend uh, more time on editing than any other aspect of my workflow. Sometimes people don't know that, especially clients, they don't know that. But it's, it's where I spend most of my time. And this is, of course, where you can correct all the issues that occurred in, in camera due to, you know, improper exposure, lack of sharpness, etc. You can enhance the colors, you can remove blemishes, you can clean up the backgrounds, all of that kind of stuff. So here's a before and after of Zeus, gorgeous German Shepherd. You can see right away the initial shot, it's underexposed. Easily, I corrected that. Uh, I, I added some, some enhancement to the contrast, shadows, the highlights. I enhanced the saturation on the blue a little bit. And as well, I used a liquify tool and I've just brought his, uh, his, 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 uh, the side on our, our left here just to the center, just to make the image more symmetrical. 
So the idea here is to know how to use these tools in Lightroom and in Photoshop, just so you can take your images to the next level. So here's another image of a really gorgeous dog. It's clearly underexposed. So the first thing I would do is correct the exposure. So now we've adjusted the exposure. We can take a look at the other issues. So of course, the backdrop needs some work, a bit of uh, dust and stuff on the backdrop. It's not perfectly white. Um, there's some issues with copying, of course. But let's zoom in a little bit here. So when we zoom in, we've got all this kind of gunk on, on uh, her face, so little boogers and dandruff and that kind of stuff. Super easy to retouch this out. Uh, when working with dog's fur, it's, it's very forgiving when it comes to retouching, not like, you know, doing beauty photography uh, with, the, with a person's skin. So it's very easy. You just go with the clone stamp tool or uh, the spot healing brush tool and just touch all this up. As well, you'll notice the green tape here is adding a bit of a color cast onto her nose. Very, very subtle, but uh, these things uh, do, do make a difference if you can correct them. So, we're, so once we sharpen the image up, we clean up all the, uh, the, the gunk, remove that uh, color cast here. I'll just flip back and forth a little bit. Makes a much, much of a, a big difference here. I also just made the background perfectly white. So here's the final image. And as you can see, uh, I enhanced the eyes slightly as well. Just a subtle adjustment of the contrast is enough to make them pop without making it look overdone. You don't want to make the dog look like freaky by, by pushing the, the contrast too much in the eyes. So there's before and there's after. So here's a gang of uh, three German shorthead pointers. So the one on the left uh, is blind in case you're wondering. Really sweet bunch here. Uh, so this is the original image uh, straight out of camera. So you'll notice a few things. Firstly, it's slightly underexposed. The background isn't perfect. We've got a bit of blemishes in the back. There are a lot of uh, dust and stuff on, on, the, on the floor here. Um, I, I could get away with some of this stuff, but uh, I'm a perfectionist. And so uh, I, I went in and I really tidied everything up. And just the exposure, I've made all the blemishes in the background perfect. And uh, I'll flip back and forth a little bit, just so you can see a little bit of the changes that I've made. So we're going to zoom in on the puppy here. And this is the original image. And I'll flip to the final here. So you'll notice I've removed the wart that she had on her, uh, on her lower lip. Uh, sometimes uh, if a client requests that kind of stuff, I'll do that. Sometimes uh, clients feel that scars and whatnot are part of a pet's story and identity, and they like to keep that. And I always respect and honor that. Um, you'll notice as well that her right side here is falling into shadows. Um, and uh, you'll, you'll notice that I added a catch light. So I actually broke one of my rules. I added the catch light here, and I just went in with a bit of a, uh, an adjustment brush, and I just brightened up her side of her face just to make the exposure a little bit more even. It's a very subtle uh, change. Um, like I said, we, we don't always want to be just uh, carelessly adding catch lights in and stuff like that. But in a, in, in a case like this, I felt like, you know, I, I can get away with it and uh, I can take this image to an, the next level. And, and so that's what I did here. We can't always nail things in camera and uh, I do my best, but if I, if I need to rely on, on retouching magic, I'm more than happy to do that. So because uh, it wasn't a close-up headshot of just the puppy alone, we can get away with it. As well, you'll notice that her right paw is, uh, is shifting towards her body, just like that. So using the liquid tool, I just brought it inwards a little just to make the image more symmetrical. So you'll notice in, in the original that her paw is sticking out. It's just throwing the whole image off balance. So by drawing it in, it becomes less of a distraction and it's about even with the other dog's uh, outer paw. So don't be afraid to make these changes when, when doing your retouching. And lastly, we'll just go in with the spot healing brush tool and just tidy up the background. Um, it's super important for me to do this. This is what studio photography to me is about. It's about things being nice and clean and perfect. Uh, if you're not willing to put in the time and effort to do this, I think it's best to just stick to shooting outside. So we'll start to wrap up here. So what you'll need to get started as a pet photographer. Once again, of course, DSLR, mirrorless camera, you'll need a kit lens, just as our very basic kit lens. That's how I started. And I, I still use a kit lens. Um, it, it's great. Uh, it, don't let any, any photographers make you feel insecure about it or give you any flag for it. The kit, kit lenses are, are, are fantastic, very versatile tools. You can get away with a speed light. You just need a, a wireless trigger to uh, trigger that speed light. Um, you can start with a very basic shoot through umbrella, super cheap, super light, portable, a light stand to, uh, to, to hold all of that up. You can use a flat finish vertical surface, a blank wall, a piece of Bristol board. It can hang a cloth. You'll need a fast memory card because you're going to be firing a lot of shots uh, uh, rapidly. So you want your card to uh, be able to uh, keep up with the pace. 
Of course, you'll need Photoshop to really perfect your images. You'll need a lot of treats. You'll need a lot of toys. You'll need a lot of noisemakers. And of course, once you have all these things, you know, go out there and uh, shoot a lot of pets, build your portfolio and uh, show it off. And people will be coming to you to capture and immortalize uh, their, their, their family pets. So uh, I want to just talk qu quickly about uh, the, uh, the mentorship and the education uh, that I offer here. So I'm working on a, a, an online course called Mastering Dog Photography in the Studio. Uh, you can visit brentasilva.com slash education to sign up for the newsletter to, to stay posted on when that's coming out. As well, I do offer one-on-one uh, -on -one consultations. So I uh, offer portfolio reviews, uh, retouching lessons in Photoshop. We can also talk about things like uh, marketing and business insight as well. So uh, you can find me on Instagram at brentasilva and online brentasilva.com. I really want to thank you so much for your attention today. Uh, thank you once again to B&H as well. This really means a whole lot to me to share my work is just uh, a, an absolute highlight and a pleasure. And I'm humbled that, uh, that uh, I get this opportunity to share with you all. Now, please, uh, if you have any questions, I'm more than happy to help you out. Absolutely. Well, uh, it, it's always a pleasure to have you here, Brent. Uh, we've had you here in the past. So for anybody who didn't have an opportunity to catch them last time, hopefully you got an opportunity this time. Uh, you could obviously rewatch this event as well as all of our events. Just as a you know, side note, you can go on vimeo.com slash BH Event Space, YouTube for this event, uh, our Facebook page, BH Event Space. So many avenues to rewatch this great content. But uh, First and foremost, I want to thank you, Brent, for, for sharing your knowledge and being here and helping uh, educate and, and just uh, do what you love. So we really appreciate that. You're so welcome. Um, first, I think a great question that came in that uh, sometimes we get, sometimes we don't, and it doesn't get enough love, but I think it's a great starter question from Rick. We talked about it. Uh, you use the SL2 in particular. It's a crop sensor camera. Can you just talk about that a little bit? Can you explain what a crop sensor camera is exactly? For sure. So originally, uh, I believe um, a, a, a film was a certain size, 35 millimeters. So when they went to digital, they created a, a 35 millimeter uh, full frame sensor. And so it was a large sensor within a camera. I may be wrong about the measurement of that, but nonetheless, it's, it's a large sensor. And because it's large, it's able to take in uh, more light. So we have better low light capability. And as well, it has, um, it, it has an influence on the depth of the field as well. But those sensors, I guess they got expensive. And so the, the, the camera companies began to uh, offer smaller sensors, which we call crop sensors. So they basically put in a smaller sensor into the camera. And because it's a smaller sensor, it doesn't allow in as much light. Um, and uh, so there's a little bit of a, a, a drop in, in low light capability. There's a little bit of an impact on the depth of field as well. And the focal uh, range uh, is affected. So if you put a, um, a 50 millimeter lens on a full frame, you get a different angle of view than if you were to take that and put it on a crop sensor because the crop sensor um, is, is looking, you're looking essentially literally as at a cropped section of what would be a full frame. So there's a little bit of math that you need to do to, uh, to understand what focal um, uh, equivalence you have. Um, for me within the studio, because I shoot with bright strobes, I, I have so much bright light that the SL2, because it's a, it, even though it's a crop sensor, it's still a great camera. And so I don't get a lot of um, uh, noise and, and low quality. Uh, it also allows me uh, on the crop sensor to use certain lenses like the, uh, the kit lenses, for example, like the 18 to 200 millimeter. It's designed to only fit on crop sensor cameras. So uh, we have that huge focal range, whereas on a full frame camera, we don't have uh, those really super zoom lenses that have this huge focal range uh, to take advantage of. So there are pluses and, and there are pros and cons to using both a full frame and a crop sensor. Um, it's really important, I think, that, um, that when you're choosing your camera that uh, you kind of uh, do some research and, and look at some different uh, stuff online as well. And... Um, I think um, I think it's important, at least for me, to to know that be, even though crop sensors are are cheaper, it doesn't mean that they're not great quality cameras. I take all of my photos with a crop sensor and I, I blow them up poster size, 
And to me, they look great. I, I use them on websites online, uh, super high res. It looks great. I, I don't uh, think that um, there's, uh, there's anything wrong with crop sensors. I think that more people should take advantage of them. Awesome. Great. Now, moving on to Fernando over here, joining us on YouTube. Thanks for joining. Uh, would like to know, you spoke about that wonderful black backdrop that you have. Uh, he's curious as to where you source that from. Right. So I sourced this from a photographer uh, that was just uh, downsizing their studio. I got really lucky. I would have never known that it, is, it even existed. Uh, I believe it's called Diamond Cloth. So I have a big one. It's just behind me right here, actually. And... Um, it's like 20 feet long, throw in the wash, uh, nothing, no fading, nothing. It's really, really great stuff. Um, diamond cloth, you can check that out. Uh, hopefully it's available online. Awesome. Now, Kathy wants to know, she's joining us here from Vimeo. How do you get rid of dander? Uh, she's getting a lot of dander with the shelter animals. Sorry, what was that? Uh, how do you get rid of dander? Sorry, I'm not sure what dander is. Um, I think, I think I could be completely wrong, but I think, I think the dander is kind of like all the shedding of the pet hair and Kathy, you can, you can clarify that if I'm completely wrong, but, uh, but I think that's what dander is. Okay. Okay. Well, it's, it's a very, very, uh, uh, meticulous labor of love. I go in there, I zoom in and with the clone stamp tool or the spot healing brush tool, I'm just selecting every little thing out. It takes time. And when you have a, a series of 20, 30 images, it can be a little overwhelming. Um, but but that it, it, it really makes a big difference. If you go in in Photoshop, uh, healing, healing brush tool, uh, clone stamp tool, sometimes you can get away with the effect called dust and scratches. So there's a very uh, versatile tool in Photoshop called, called dust and scratches. And you can kind of uh, uh, use that to uh, isolate certain uh, artifacts depending on their size and it will uh, kind of clean them out. But ultimately there is no quick uh, one, one, you know, button solution. It is a labor of love to really go in there and tidy these little things up. Awesome. Now talking a little bit about Photoshop, you mentioned Photoshop. Jesse uh, is, is joining us on zoom wants to know, uh, can you use Lightroom or something like Snapseed or, you know, is Photoshop really the, the way to go? So, Lightroom is, uh, to me, uh, the way I see Lightroom is it's a, a way to, to batch edit uh, uh, the, the levels in an image, uh, in, in a series of images. So shadows, highlights, exposure, et cetera. So what I do is I take a whole set from a series, put them in Lightroom. I put a, a general uh, sort of a preset, you could say, base, I, I recreate the preset every time for every new subject. And then I just apply it across the entire uh, session. And so then all of my images are kind of corrected uh, in that way. And then what I do is I export them as JPEGs and then I bring them into Photoshop. And that's when I really go to town, zooming in, tidying everything up, adjusting the colors, adjusting uh, uh, more of uh, uh, local adjustments with layers and, and brushes and things like that, dodging and burning. So that's when I really go in. Lightroom is more of a, a general way to just batch edit. Um, you can get away with Snapseed, but I feel like uh, very quickly you will outgrow it and you'll find that uh, Photoshop will, will, will be where you end up. Wonderful. And now Cindy wants to know, uh, referring to that image where you had the three dogs, how do you get multiple dogs to sit next to each other? <laughs> right. So it comes down to patience. So uh, quite literally, that can take 20 minutes, half an hour of just having the owners standing uh, just out of frame and just constantly just putting their hand on the dog. Every time the dog gets up, put, put, put your hand on the dog and the dog will sit. Eventually the dog uh, just realizes this is, they, they give up. They realize I can't go anywhere. I have to sit here next to, you know, my, my, my brothers and sisters and I'm waiting there ready to fire and shoot. I'm waiting for the split second moment when they're all looking in the camera. I'm making noise and whatnot, but there's just a split second when it happens and I'm ready to capture it. I have the owners uh, assisting me handling their own dogs. Um, I didn't mention uh, that in my presentation, but that's a big part of my session is that it's, a, it's an entire family event. It's a lot of fun but it is work. And I outlined that uh, to all my clients beforehand. They do know that they will be, you know, coming in and, and, and helping uh, uh, handle their dogs. Um, 
and, and for the simple fact that it's their dog, they know how, how to treat their dog, they know how they respond. And, and ultimately, they also know that uh, the better their dog uh, poses, the, uh, the better photos we get. But really, it comes down to just being very firm, persistent, and not giving in to the dogs. If the dog wants to leave uh, and stand up and walk away, we're the boss, we're the adults, we're the humans, we're going to say, no, we're doing something, we're going to put them back. And we're going to just keep doing it. I never give up. Um, sometimes the clients will give up and they'll say, ah, okay, forget. And I'll say, no, no, you came here because you wanted a photo with all of your pets together. So we're going to do everything we can to do it. And so it's really just comes down to just persistence. Awesome. Wonderful. You heard it here first. Persistence, patience, it's key. Brent, thank you so much again for being here. We really appreciate it to everybody at home. Thank you for joining us today. We hope you all enjoyed National Pet Day. If uh, if you haven't yet, you, you still got a you still got a lot of time left in the day. So go go hug either your pet or well, don't just go hug a random person's pet. Ask first. Ask first. Get permission, and then you know, give it a hug. Give it a little you know, tussle on the head. But uh, that's all the time we have for today. This has been another edition of the BH Virtual Event Space. We'll catch you next.